friends, let me read from God's word. We're going to continue um, our series looking through different passages in the book of Hebrews that call us to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 9 to the end of the chapter. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. In this passage uh, today, um, it contains the first reference to the Lord Jesus Christ as our high priest. And it's often tempting um, when we think of the book of Hebrews, we think it's a book about the high priesthood of Christ. Um, if you're looking uh, uh, into discovering more about the high priesthood of Christ, Hebrews is one of the first places you go in the scriptures. But it is not a theoretical book in any way. The book of Hebrews is intensely pastoral. The overriding drive behind the book of Hebrews is that we may always remember the purpose of the book is so that we may not drift away. That is, not drift away from Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. Hebrews 12 verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of the faith. Again and again in the book of Hebrews, we are kind of jolted into remembering we must fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. The week before that, uh, we looked in Hebrews chapter 6 um, and verses 19 and 20. And in verse 19, we're told that we have this hope in Christ as an anchor for the soul. The book of Hebrews is a bit like that anchor uh, or that, that rope that, that keeps us connected to the anchor in many ways. I don't know if you've been on a, a boat that's small enough to, to really be buffeted around uh, on the swell in the ocean, um, but big enough to have its own anchor, um, some kind of uh, more substantial rowing boat um, on the sea or, or, or a rib or something like that. Um, and if you're out uh, and you've weighed anchor, uh, and if it's um, maybe slightly windy or there's quite a lot of uh, swell, quite a current, and you're constantly being pulled away from the anchor, the anchor is dug deeply into the sand, uh, the seabed, uh, and when the rope becomes taut, suddenly you get jolted um, in the boat, uh, and then you often move back towards being over the top of the anchor, and then you move away again, um, and you get jolted. These sections in Hebrews, and Hebrews as a whole, uh, and my prayer is that through these sermons, that we, through this lockdown, through this pandemic, may constantly have this jolt from the book of Hebrews to remember Christ, to fix our eyes on Jesus, 
the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He is our hope, our only hope, and he is our anchor. As we look at, at the passage in Hebrews, we're going to focus from verses 14 through 18. Um, and we're going to look uh, a little bit about uh, the incarnation. Um, this chapter, Hebrews 2, has just wonderfully rich, deep uh, and exciting theological arguments um, for the fact that God is unchanging and unchangeable and yet God the Son became a man. It, it's wonderful. And um, you can look at issues of, of, div- of the impeccability of Christ um, and whether or not he could be tempted. There are so many incredible theological issues in this chapter. But we're going to keep it fairly straightforward, fairly simple. First of all, um, God became a human being in Christ Jesus. Secondly, so that by his death, he may do two things. The first is that he may destroy the work of the devil and free those from the fear of death and who were held in slavery by the fear of death. And then secondly, he became a man so that by his death, he may become a merciful and faithful high priest to make atonement for our sins, to make propitiation for our sins. So first of all, God became a man. God the Son became a human being in Christ Jesus. As we read the book of Hebrews, we learn more, especially in chapter 2, about the humanity of Christ. But as we read chapter 2, we must always look back to chapter 1 of Hebrews. Chapter 1 of Hebrews is a series basically of bullet points or of just being shot at again and again and again. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. It is emphatic. It is repeated. It is constant. From the Old Testament, Hebrews 1's emphasis is that Jesus Christ is God. It tells us that he is God himself of one substance with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And it also tells us that Christ is God the Son. And as the Son of God, he is the heir of the universe and the creator and sustainer of all things. He is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of his nature. He upholds, in verse 3, all things by the word of his power. All the angels in heaven worship Jesus. One day every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This Christ who is God the Son, the Son became a human being. So in Hebrews chapter 2, we learn of this glorious incarnation. We learn about it in verse 14. We're told, since the children, that's us as believers, have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. Verses 16 and 17 from the passage that we read, for surely it's not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. And for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. Christ helps the children of Abraham. And we understand that that spiritually is believers. It's us, descendants, not just physically, but descendants of the promise of God, um, uh, bringing uh, the Messiah, bringing the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus stops at nothing to save us. And overall, in the incarnation, God the Son becomes a human. Cyril of Alexandria, um, the 4th the, the and 5th century um, church father, speaks of Christ as the infinite infant when he was first born. And we talk about this often at Christmas, don't we? But it's just majestically mind-blowing that the creator and sustainer of the universe should be utterly dependent uh, as, as a fetus, as an embryo in his mother's womb, and then fed by his mother, unable to speak, unable to, to, to voluntarily move, unable to focus um, his eyes at, at a young age. The infinite God of the universe becomes this infant. If you're a, a pastor in your church, um, sometimes 
it can be very easy to have an overemphasis on either Christ's humanity or on his divinity. Or if you're a member uh, in your church, a, a believer who, who loves reading the word of God and loves studying God's word, it can be very easy to kind of fall on, on one side or the other to emphasize either Christ's humanity or his divinity. But it's so important as we read Hebrews that we hold them both together in our minds um, because Christ is he's a hundred percent God and he's a hundred percent man. He is God according to his divine nature and man according to his human nature. Two natures in one person. God the Son incarnate, the God man. Why did Jesus become a man? For two reasons that we're told about in Hebrews chapter 2. The first reason is so that he may destroy the work of the devil and free us from slavery. And secondly, so that he may become a merciful and faithful high priest. So verses 14 and 15 uh, in the passage that we read from, um, it says this, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. At the moment, through this pandemic, with the death toll in the UK rising over 100,000, um, if you remember back at the beginning of the first lockdown, uh, or even when, when the first news reports um, about Chinatown it, um, uh, in areas in, in London where Chinese takeaways were, were losing money because of fear of this virus coming out of Wuhan in China. All the way back then, we had no idea what the death toll would be like um, in the UK. We had no idea we'd be talking about 100,000 deaths in the UK. Suddenly, death has become a very real reality. Death as the last enemy has has become much bigger in the minds uh, of our collective our collective mind uh, as a um, as a culture at the moment. For us and for those in our churches, do we fear death? Are we afraid of death? Not the pain of death. Some people who die uh, of COVID, it can be horrendous. Some people die in their sleep incredibly peacefully. Not fear of the process, but fear of death itself. The moment when you cease to be alive in this world. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 15 says the fate of the fool will overtake me also. For the writer uh, of Ecclesiastes to say that, that the, the wisest person um, writing such an extraordinary book to say actually the fate that overtakes the fool will overtake me. It will overtake me, it will overtake you, everyone. Um, suffers this same fate. And Ecclesiastes again says, whether it be man or beast. Marcus Aurelius, uh, the Roman emperor, wrote that both Alexander the Great and his donkey suffered the same fate, death. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 19. Man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? That no matter how successful you are, no matter how strong you are, no matter how unstoppable someone may feel, death is the final enemy and there is nothing we can do to avoid it. You will die one day. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 later in this book emphasises that when we die, we immediately face the judgment and one of the reasons why humans fear death so profoundly, even though we try and inoculate ourselves against it um, kind of mentally, even though we try and avoid it and push it under the carpet culturally, yet we fear it because we know that whatever is after death will immediately present itself. We fear that possibility. The Bible clearly teaches that after death, we will be judged, Christian or not Christian, for every action, every thought. If you are not a Christian, then the thought of being publicly judged for everything you've ever done or thought or said 
is terrifying. And so, in a sense, the obvious psychological thing to do is to ignore that as a possibility. And we see that in our culture. Historically, we see Ludwig Wittgenstein writing, um, uh, he, he did the same thing, saying that death is not an experience in life, but it is the limit of life. And therefore, it is irrational to fear death. You see that uh, Nagel, a more contemporary philosopher, says there is something that can only be called the expectation of nothingness. And though the mind tends to veer away from it, it is an unmistakable experience, always startling, often frightening, and very different from the familiar recognition that your life will go on for only a limited time. Through all the philosophy of this world, we still, deep inside us, fear death. We try and cloak it over um, by different uh, ways of understanding it philosophically. We see that in Star Trek, don't we? In The Next Generation with, with Data, you know, the android character, when he's discussing kind of the, the termination of his life, he expresses it that actually this will bring a sense of completion to my life. The idea that death brings completion to our life is just trying to cover up our fear of death. There is only one thing that can get rid of our fear of death, and that is Jesus. Jesus is the only one. Verse 14, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery. Jesus Christ himself died and through his death he rendered the devil powerless that is so wonderful i remember a while ago with a good friend of mine with matt he's currently the chairman of the efcc a really good friend of mine he and he and i went caving together and there was a this section um in the water where there was a, a whole kind of tunnel underwater you had to go under it and through um uh, through the water and then up the other side we didn't know what was on the other side but and so therefore it was it was scary it was very scary but matt had already looked online um, and he knew that someone else had been through that route someone else had gone under and up the other side even though it was pitch black even though it was watery that's what death is like isn't it and we know the person who has been through it and come out the other side we know jesus he has died on the cross and been raised to life again on the third day. The Lord Jesus, in his death, destroys the work of the devil, renders him powerless, and so wonderfully frees us who believe from the fear of death. Friends, if you're trusting in Jesus, Jesus has been through death for you. We saw a couple of weeks ago, didn't we, in, in Hebrews 6, 18 and 19, that Jesus is that forerunner. He's gone through death. So you don't need to be afraid. And God's word gives you that as a promise. So you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to fear death. The second reason why Jesus became incarnate, firstly, we've seen so that he may destroy the work of the devil and free us from the fear of death. The second reason is so that he may become a merciful and faithful high priest to make atonement, to make propitiation for our sins. It's so wonderful. This is like the, the highest possible calling. We hear of people in this world, don't we, doing incredible things, making incredible statements. Elon Musk recently has um, said that his ambition at the moment is to have a million humans living on a colony on Mars by 2050. That's unbelievably optimistic and it's extraordinary. Perhaps it will happen, we don't know. But that is insignificant compared to what Christ did. It is utterly trivial compared to what the Lord Jesus did. He died for us. He conquered death and he has freed us, liberated us from the fear of death. And more than that, he's become a faithful high priest for us 
to make atonement for the sins of the people. We read about atonement a lot in the scriptures, don't we? Uh, and in this context, it is it is a propitiation more specifically rather than just more generally atonement. And by propitiation, as we've looked recently in Hebrews, um, the writer means that God's wrath at our sin has been absorbed, uh, has been dealt with. I like that, the illustration of um, uh, lava pouring out of a volcano um, and then going into the water and, and the heat, the fire, the intensity of that heat is then absorbed in the sea as it, as it falls into the sea. It's absorbed. God's wrath at our sin fell on Christ on the cross, on the cross and therefore God's wrath has been propitiated. And he looks at us favorably. It is awesome. Do you, friends, have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you put your faith in the death of Christ on the cross to take away your sin, to propitiate your sin? Then the fear of death and the power of that fear and the power of the devil over your life is gone completely. But we still live in a fallen world, don't we? And in this lockdown, we're... Uh, the kind of our, our sin is under the microscope, especially if you're living with, with family um, in, in, a, uh, in a kind of a close knit environment. Um, when we're constantly living in one another's pockets um, all the time, we're allowed out once a day for exercise. It's, it's hard. And suddenly our sin is under a microscope and it's amplified by the difficulty. Friends, Jesus knows what we're going through. He has been tempted in every way, just as we have, and yet he was without sin. And Hebrews 2 verse 18 tells us, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Friends, do you feel tied down, pinned down? Do you feel that you cannot get out? Do you feel stuck and trapped? Jesus was nailed to the cross for you. You can endure this. Do you feel isolated from everyone around you? Jesus was abandoned by all his friends. And Jesus on the cross cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we can know the presence of God in our lives. Friends, sometimes we might feel in this lockdown, this is all getting to me so much and I don't know what to do to get away with it. And so just like a balloon kind of expanding and expanding as we feel more and more pressure, the weak point in the balloon is where it bursts first. So what is your weak point? Maybe you're thinking, oh, this is just too much pressure. And we turn to sin. We lose our temper. We snap. We look at things we shouldn't on the Internet. We snap. Friends, the Lord Jesus Christ knows what you're going through. He knows your temptations. He has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. And wonderfully, we have that promise, don't we, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Let me read uh, those verses. That's such a wonderful verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The Apostle Paul says um, from verse 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Dear friends, if you're trusting in Christ, and you're feeling that the pressure is mounting, and just like that balloon expanding, that you're feeling close to, to popping point, the Lord always provides a way of escape, a way for us to flee from temptation. And he has given you every needed spiritual resource to fight against temptation, to be watchful. And you have a faithful high priest over the house of God who knows what you're going through, who went through death for you, rendering the devil and his work and the fear of death powerless over us. And he became a merciful and faithful high priest. 
we have an awesome savior friends so just like that anchor me through this uh through this message and particularly through the book of hebrews may we be jolted again to remember look to christ fix your eyes on jesus don't give up keep enduring keep being sustained by the constancy of christ and the hope that we have in the lord jesus christ amen